The rest of the news, U.S. Navy sailors on board the USS Ronald Reagan were some of the first Americans to respond to the tsunami and nuclear disaster in Fukushima, Japan in 2011. Now they're suing TEPCO, the company in charge of the stricken Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. At least 71 sailors on the USS Ronald Reagan have reported radiation sickness. And they're suing TEPCO, alleging that the company knowingly downplayed the dangers of nuclear radiation at that Fukushima site. Of those 71 sailors, at least half now have some form of cancer, according to the lawyer representing them. And other sailors are dealing with thyroid and reproductive health problems. So did TEPCO knowingly mislead the world about the radioactive dangers at Fukushima immediately following the devastating tsunami? And could this lawsuit be the first of many to come? Joining me now for more on this is Kevin Camps, radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. It's always nice to see you. Thank you. Um, so what's the story? I think I haven't, I've seen absolutely no coverage of this in any American media. Uh, so first of all, is it actually real that, that uh, the soldiers aboard the USS Ronald Reagan off the coast of uh, Japan when, when Fukushima melted down were exposed to high levels of radiation? Well, it's a shocking story, and I first learned of it last March 11th, which was the second anniversary of the Fukushima catastrophe beginning in 2011. So two they, of the, they had kept this buried for two years? Two of the sailors came to a big gathering in New York City to mark the anniversary, and they were suffering health effects from their service on board the Reagan. Turns out that the Reagan was anchored just a mile or two off of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant during the worst of the radioactivity releases, right. which was news to me. I mean, I follow this as closely as I can. Two years into this thing, I find out that the Reagan was that close to these catastrophic radioactivity releases. So the crew on board that ship, 5,000 plus sailors, were in harm's way for several long days on end not warned by TEPCO, not warned by the Japanese government, not warned by the United States government, which had radiation detecting planes flying all over northeastern Japan. So, well, you would think the, that an aircraft carrier in this day of dirty bombs and, and you know, the, the, that they would have radiation detectors on the, on, on the, on the ship. Well, uh, some of the first news that was really disturbing in the first days of Fukushima Daiichi was that the aircraft carrier detected radioactivity on the helicopters coming back landing on board the flight deck. And so one of the sailors who's now stepped forward in a big way was servicing those helicopters. Another of these uh, sailors that I met in New York, uh, his name is Maurice Ennis. He set off the radiation monitors below deck when he came down from being on the flight deck. So there were lots of indications that there was something seriously wrong, but they stayed in this contamination plume for days on end. So they were getting the radioactive gases, which they were breathing in. They were getting the fallout onto them, so they're being exposed that way. Okay. What I didn't realize until this latest news about the relaunch of this lawsuit against Tokyo Electric, even the water that the sailors were drinking was from their desalination system. So they were getting the seawater that was contaminated with radioactivity. It was being desalinated by the ship, and they were drinking it. They were cooking with it. They were showering with it. Whoa. But those desalination processes don't take out the radioactivity. Right, because salt is a fairly large molecule. It's, it's uh, sodium and chloride. And if you've got just an individual atom as opposed to a molecule or a particle, the desalination is not going to take it out. Right? You need special filters. You can't get tritium out of water, period. Not oh, at it's, industrial scale. It's small. It is it's, water. It's helium. I yeah. Mean, it's hydrogen. It's hydrogen. radioactive hydrogen. Yeah. You need special filtering to get out the cesium, to get out the strontium. None of that was taking place. So that ingestion pathway combined with all the others could account for some of these health effects we're seeing. So what's the, uh, you know, has the government stepped up and done anything? Are they testing the 5,000 soldiers or is it just these 71 who are sick or suing? I mean, what's the deal? Well, the common story I keep hearing from these sailors who are, you know, stepping up and speaking out is they don't even have health care. I'm not sure what's going on, but they're kind of on their own resources. Most have had to leave the service because of debilitating so health conditions. So. They seem to be in, you know, desperate straits. They're looking for, you know, wow. some funding to help them get the health care wow. that they need. You know, Senator Sanders is the chairman of the Veterans Committee. Somebody, you should, you should bring that to his attention. Um, I'll try to do so tomorrow. Uh, he's going to be on our show. Um, we, we just have 90 seconds here. I'm wondering what's the, you know, we've heard that Reactor 3 has got steam coming out of it. Uh, we were reporting today on our radio show that, it's not, you know, there, it doesn't seem to be an immediate crisis. What's, what, what is going on? 
Well, I think Arnie Gunderson at Fairwinds has explained it well. It's the weather conditions that make the steam visible. But what people need to realize is that we're almost three years into this thing. Those releases are happening every day. Those releases atmospherically. It's just that when it gets cold enough, you see it. You see the condensation. Yeah. But those releases into the ocean are happening every day. They have been for three years. So that is the massive radioactivity release that's going on. Once in a while, it becomes more visible because of atmospheric conditions that you would see, uh, you know, you see your breath when it's cold outside. Right. So we're seeing this heated water coming out of Unit 3. It's just the tip of the iceberg. It's and, and Unit 4, the one that was listing that had all the rods up at the top, that they were going to start taking those rods out, the pulling the cigarettes out yeah. of the broken, crushed pack. Yeah. How's that going? Very little reporting, which is kind of scary, actually. So one would assume that without the reporting that it must be going smoothly, but I'm not sure that that's the case. Maybe it's not going at all? We don't know. We, we hear very little about what's going on. Uh, and and, and, and the, uh, the stories about the Japanese mafia hiring homeless guys to clean this site up, is that true? You know what's incredible? Yeah, it is true, is this new State Secrets Act is making things even worse, where it was difficult for reporters to get in and cover this stuff in the first place. Now it's against the law. It was the Japanese State Secrets Act. That's right. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Kevin Camps, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Tom. You are watching Global Report News with me, Cleo V. Homeless men employed to clean up the stricken Fukushima nuclear plant, including those brought in by Japan's Yakuza gangsters, were not aware of the health risks they were taking, and say their bosses treated them like, quote, disposable people. An investigative journalist who went undercover at Fukushima, filming with a camera hidden in his watch, says that many of the workers were brought into the nuclear plant by Japan's organized crime syndicate. Because the Japanese government has been reluctant to invite multinational workers into the country, its nuclear industry mostly uses cheap domestic labor. These so-called, quote, nuclear gypsies are homeless men from the Sanya neighborhood of Tokyo and Kamagasaki. Quote, working conditions in the nuclear industry have always been bad, the deputy director of Osaka's Hanan Choi Hospital, Saburo Murata, told Reuters. Problems with money, outsourced recruitment, lack of proper health insurance, these have existed for decades. The problem is that after Japan's parliament approved a bill to fund decontamination work in August 2011, the law did not apply existing rules regulating the profitable construction industry. Therefore, contractors engaged in decontamination were not required to share information on their management, so anyone could instantly become a nuclear contractor. The night is cold here in Sendai, far to the north of Tokyo. This station is the warmest place to sleep for people living rough. <laughs> It's also a fertile recruiting ground. Brokers are selling homeless people like this to companies cleaning up radiation in Fukushima. Shizuya Nishiyama's been sleeping rough for a year, and he's twice been sent to scrub down radioactive hotspots. We're an easy target for recruiters. We turn up here with all our bags, wheeling them around and around the station, and we're easy to spot. Then they say to us, are you looking for work? Are you hungry? Activists say homeless people are flocking here from across Japan to look for work in the tsunami devastated north. But the safer jobs are now in short supply. Yasuhiro Aoki is the leader of this homeless support group. Many workers are reaching their radiation limits, he says, so there's a shortage and the homeless are being used to fill in the gaps. There are no figures for the number of homeless people cleaning up Fukushima. Government rules don't require checks on the lowest tier of companies supplying workers. On the 11th floor of this apartment block lives one of Sendai's labor brokers, Seiji Sasa. I don't ask any questions. That's not my job. I just find people and send them to work. I send them and get money in exchange. That's it. I don't get involved in what happens after that. Back at Sendai Station, radiation is the last thing on Nishiyama's mind. He says he just wants to make it through the winter.